Hi class, so today I'm going to try to record my first read aloud um, for you. I'm going to start reading one of my favorite books for fantasy and science fiction um, in the entire genre. It is a very old book written in 1961 and it is called The Phantom Tollbooth. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. It's literally one of my favorite books ever um, and that's because it has so much that I think bends your mind and makes you think deeper. Um, and also, it's a really exciting, fun story with a lot of wordplay. And if you know me, you know I like puns, I like wordplay, so why wouldn't I like this? So, um, this is the cover of the book. You'll find out later who that is and that. You're going to see a lot of this map. I'll come back and show it to you. Um, but for right now, just take a quick glance. Phantom Toll Booth by Norton Jester. Illustrated by Jules Pfeiffer. This is the table of contents. You'll notice there are 20 chapters and chapter one is called Milo. I'll show you the pictures every once in a while when they come up. There once was a boy named Milo who didn't know what to do with himself. Not just sometimes, but always. When he was in school, he longed to be out and when he was out, he longed to be in. On the way, he thought about coming home and coming home, he thought about going. Wherever he was, he wished he were somewhere else, and when he got there, he wondered why he'd bothered. Nothing really interested him, least of all the things that should have. <laughs> it seems to me that almost everything is a waste of time, he remarked one day as he walked dejectedly home from school. <sighs> I can't see the point in learning to solve useless problems or subtracting turnips from turnips or knowing where Ethiopia is or how to spell February. And since no one bothered to explain otherwise to him, he regarded the process of seeking knowledge as the greatest waste of all. Milo. As he and his unhappy thoughts hurried along, for while he was never anxious to be where he was going, he liked to get there as quickly as possible. It seemed a great wonder that the world, which was so large, could sometimes feel so small and empty. And worst of all, he continued sadly, there's nothing for me to do, nowhere I'd care to go, and hardly anything worth seeing. He punctuated this last thought with such a deep sigh that a house sparrow singing nearby stopped and rushed home to be with his family. Without stopping or looking up, he rushed past the buildings and busy shops that lined the street and in a few minutes reached home. Dashed through the lobby, hopped onto the elevator, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and off again, opened the apartment door, rushed into his room, flopped dejectedly into a chair, and grumbled softly. <sighs> Another long afternoon. He looked glumly at all the things he owned. The books that were too much trouble to read, the tools he had never learned to use, the small electric automobile he hadn't driven in months, or was it years, and the hundreds of other games and toys and bats and balls and bits and pieces scattered around him. And then, to one side of the room, just next to the phonograph, he noticed something he had certainly never seen before. Who could have possibly left such an enormous package and such a strange one? For while it was not square, it was definitely not round. And for its size was larger than almost any other big package of smaller dimension than he had ever seen. Hmm. So this is a big moment when we're reading um, fantasy. So... It's important to learn that we should question along and pay attention when our characters ask big questions. So when Milo seems suspicious of something, it's probably because we as readers should also be suspicious of that thing. 
so we should wander with him. Why is there this random package in the corner of his room? Let's find out. Attached to one side was a bright blue envelope, which said simply, for Milo, who has plenty of time. Of course, if you've ever gotten a surprise package, you could imagine how puzzled and excited Milo was. And if you've ever gotten one, oh, and if you've never gotten one, pay close attention, because someday you might. I don't think it's my birthday, he puzzled. And Christmas must be months away, and I haven't been outstandingly good, or even good at all. He had to admit this, even to himself. <sighs> Most probably, I won't like it anyway. <laughs> but since I don't know where it came from, I can't possibly send it back. He thought about it for quite a while, then opened the envelope, but just to be polite. One genuine turnpike toll booth, it stated, and then it went on. Easily assembled at home and for use by those who have never traveled in lands beyond. Beyond what? Thought Milo, as he continued to read. This package contains the following items. One, genuine turnpike toll booth to be erected according to directions. Three, precautionary signs to be used in a precautionary fashion, assorted coins for use in paying tolls, one map, up to date and carefully drawn by master cartographers depicting natural and man-made features, one book of rules and traffic reg regulations which may not be bent or broken. And in smaller letters, at the bottom, it concluded, Results are not guaranteed, but if not perfectly satisfied, your wasted time will be refunded. Following the instructions, which told him to cut here, lift there, and fold back all around, he soon had the toll booth, unpacked and set up on its stand. He fitted the windows in place and attached the roof, which extended out on both sides and fastened on the coin box. It was very much like the toll booths he had seen many times on family trips, except, of course, it was much smaller and purple. What a strange present, he thought to himself. The least they could have done was to send a highway with it, for it's terribly impractical without one. But since at the time there was nothing else he wanted to play with, he set up the three signs. Slow down, approaching toll booth. Please have your fare ready. Have your destination in mind. And slowly unfolded the map. As the announcement stated, it was a beautiful map. In many colors, showing principal roads, rivers and seas, towns and cities, mountains and valleys, intersections and de detours, and sites of outstanding interest, both beautiful and historic. The only trouble was that Milo had never heard of any of the places it indicated, and even the name sounded most peculiar. I don't really think there is such a country, he concluded after studying it carefully. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. And he closed his eyes and poked a finger at the map. Dictionopolis, read Milo slowly when he saw what his finger had chosen. Hmm. Oh. Well, I might as well go there as anywhere. He walked across the room and dusted off the car carefully. Then, taking the map and rule book with him, he hopped in and, for lack of anything better to do, drove slowly up to the toll booth. As he deposited his coin and rolled past, he remarked wistfully, I do hope this is an interesting game. Otherwise, hmm, the afternoon will be so Terribly dull. There's Milo in his little car. And that brings us to chapter two, called Beyond Expectations.